Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ here in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We are headed for Exodus chapter 24 tonight. So we are continuing in our study of the book of Exodus. We are more than halfway through and I would invite you to join me in Exodus chapter 24. We'll be there in just a few moments. As always, if you have any questions, any concerns about tonight's class, feel free to reach out, get in touch. My number is 608-224-0274. You can call or text that number, or you could also send me an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. We'd love to hear from you if there's something we can do or anything that we need to be praying about. But as I said, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So the people have left Egypt. They've received the Ten Commandments at the base of Mount Sinai, and they are now in the process of receiving the rest of God's law as Moses reveals it on God's behalf. And tonight then we continue with the law, and we only have 18 verses in this chapter, so I'm thinking we should get done a little little bit early tonight and uh, so let's go ahead and get going with Exodus chapter 24 and it's uh, the first two verses would be the first paragraph Exodus 24 verses 1 and 2 then he said to Moses come up to the Lord you and Aaron Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel and you shall worship at a distance Moses alone however shall come near to the Lord but they shall not come near nor shall the people come up with him well, after several chapters of God passing along commands to Moses on the mountain, God now wants some others to approach him on the mountain as well, to worship at a distance. And it seems like uh, this was a, a process that started a few chapters ago, but we had a little bit of a delay, so we kind of get back to it. Um, so not only Moses at this point, but now also Aaron and Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu. If you remember, uh, Nadab and Abihu were Aaron's uh, two oldest sons. They would have succeeded him as high priest. Uh, but remember what happened to those two men later in the Old Testament. They would go on to offer unauthorized fire before the Lord. And they were killed right there on the spot for their uh, lack of reverence to the Lord and his commands. That's in Leviticus chapter 10 if you want to learn more about that by way of review. But then in addition to Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, God also, notice, wants 70 of the elders of Israel to come up there on the mountain as well. So it's a pretty large group. But this is the first reference to the 70 elders. I think we've had a reference to the elders before. This is the first reference to the number 70 with uh, regard to these men. Uh, later, by the time we get to New Testament times, those 70 elders are referred to as the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling body, and it seems to have started right here, at least in concept, in terms of the first reference to the 70. And I'm not exactly sure why God is calling for 70 of these men. Why not 60? Why not 80? Why 70? Uh, we know there were 70 descendants of Jacob who made the trek to Egypt in Exodus 1 verse 5. Some of the commentaries were suggesting maybe it was tied to that. Uh, maybe it's just some kind of symbolic number. I know the number 7 is important, so perhaps that. Of course, we've got Jesus, you know, forgive your brother, not 7 times, but 70 times 7 and all that but for whatever reason God wants 70 of these elders these elderly men older men to come closer to the mountain than everybody else so not that they get to go all the way up there to the top but God at least calls them into uh, some kind of a, like a privilege that uh, uh, that he's giving to these men as leaders of the people so they are to worship but I want us to also notice that they are to worship at a distance so Moses is still the only one who's allowed to come near to the Lord According to Hebrews 12.24, Jesus, as a prophet like Moses, is the mediator of a new covenant. And so Moses then, of course, in a sense, mediated the first covenant, and Jesus mediated the second and the much better covenant. So I just wanted to bring that in from our study of Hebrews, since Moses is mentioned in that book. Well, let's continue tonight with the next paragraph. This is Exodus 24, verses 3 through 8. Exodus 24 verses 3 through 8. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, 
all that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Starting in verse 3, Moses recounts or repeats all of God's words to the people now. So again, Moses is the go-between. He is the mediator in a sense. God speaks to Moses. Moses speaks to the people. God does not speak to the people directly. And when they hear everything that we've studied over the past few weeks now, the, the people respond by saying, All the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. And I don't know about you personally, I'm wondering how two to three million people respond like this. Is it something they said in unison? I mean, it, they did say it with one voice. Uh, was there a spokesperson? Was it something they affirmed by saying amen? Did they sing this in response? That is a possibility. That's one way to get a lot of people together and uh, say the same thing at the same time. I don't know exactly how they did it, uh, but they are certainly agreeable to what God has said through Moses, and they answer with one voice. In verse 4 then, Moses writes down everything that the Lord has said up to this point, and I believe this may be the second reference to Moses writing something in this book. Uh, earlier, you may remember from Exodus 17, 14, God had told Moses to write down in a book that he would completely blot out the memory of the Amalekites, and so we talked about that a little bit back then, and now Moses writes down God's law. So the benefit of writing, of course, is that it never changes. And that's a, a, certainly a huge benefit to writing stuff down. Of course, today, legally, a written document has a lot more force than a conversation between two people that was never recorded. And certainly God could have chosen to transmit his law by word of mouth. A lot of things are communicated by word of mouth. Uh, but that has a way of changing over time, doesn't it? And so Moses writes it down. Uh, when you write something, it has a permanence to it that uh, the spoken word doesn't have. And so there is a certain seriousness, for example, to writing a book. Uh, once you get those words on paper, it's a big deal. That's going to be around a while. And so uh, Moses writes down everything that God said here. Well, after writing the law, Moses sets up an altar. He has the young men of Israel then offer burnt offerings and young bulls as peace offerings on this altar to the Lord. And they construct 12 pillars for the 12 sons of Israel. And I just find it interesting that he has the young men take a leading role in this. The young men are the ones who get the work done. Um, you know, offering bulls as a sacrifice was hard work. Can you imagine doing that? I've never uh, done anything like that especially on such a such a large scale. So I just find it interesting here that Moses now, as an older man himself, uh, finds some young men to kind of take charge of this and actually get the work done. Uh, building pillars is hard work, certainly, as well. So Moses then collects this blood. Uh, he puts half of it in basins. The other half he sprinkles on the altar itself. And so this most likely represents the two parties involved in this covenant. Half the blood goes on the altar, the other half goes to the people. And remember, the altar is the first thing they build that is used in worship. Even before they build the tabernacle, uh, they build an altar. So Moses then reads the book of the covenant. The people once again pledge their obedience to everything that God has commanded. And he now sprinkles the rest of the blood on the people. And he says, behold, the blood of the covenant. A couple things I want us to notice here before we move on to the next paragraph. First of all, have you guys ever tried to get blood stains out of clothing? Um, I could get stains out of just about anything. Ballpoint pen is one of the worst things to get out. Uh, Two of a chapstick going through the laundry, that's uh, pretty much a disaster. That's when you go to Goodwill and replace your clothing. Uh, Sharpie going through the laundry, that's not cool. Uh, but blood, it's up there on the list. I mean, blood has a way of staining clothing, especially, I would think, in ancient times without the stain removers that we have today. So I just want us to imagine that these people travel the next 40 years through the wilderness wearing blood-stained clothing. Can you picture that? Isn't that what it says happens here? Moses sprinkles the blood that was offered here. He, he offers half of it on the altar and half of it, the other half, is sprinkled on all the people of Israel. So again, I just want us to imagine these people traveling through the wilderness with the sprinkled blood of these bulls on their clothing. That's not something I picture when I picture the Israelites traveling through the wilderness, but it's something I'll try to picture now. Every single one of these people had blood stains on their clothing. 
So they went through daily life with a visible reminder on them at all times that they had agreed to follow God's law. It was the blood of the covenant. The covenant was ratified between God and the people with this blood. And then on the other hand, just imagine meeting these people. Imagine you're some guy out in the wilderness and you see two to three million people coming over the horizon and they start to get closer and you, and you walk up to them and every single one of these people has blood stains on their clothing. Who in the world are these people? They were distinct, weren't they? They were different from the world. They were set apart from the world uh, because of the clothing that they wore and the blood stains on it. Well, the second thing I hope we notice here is that when Moses refers to the blood of the covenant, he uses a phrase that Jesus will go on to use many years later on the night he is betrayed, on the night before he offers himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. You may remember that while Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, he says in Mark 14, 24, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I think Matthew adds, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus' blood, therefore, would ratify a new covenant. So just as the law of Moses was written down and then made effective, it went into effect at the shedding of blood, so also those words that Jesus spoke during his ministry were made effective. They were ratified by the shedding of his blood. And just a quick note on what Jesus said there, his blood was not spilled, it was poured out. And I've had this conversation with several people through the years, you know, maybe a minor point for some, uh, but to me, when something is spilled, uh, what has happened? It's an accident, isn't it? We spill something, and uh, oops, you know, a glass tips over, what was in it is spilled. The death of Jesus, on the other hand, was no accident. I don't think the Bible ever refers to the blood of Jesus being spilled. No, he offered himself willingly for us, and his blood was poured out on the cross as a sacrificial offering. So I just wanted to point that out while we were here. Well, let's continue tonight with Exodus 24, verses 9 through 11. Exodus chapter 24, verses 9 through 11. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they saw God, and they ate and drank. Now, this is an amazing passage. It is so easy to overlook this. Sometimes I, I forget this is in there. But these men go up on the mountain, or at least partway up the mountain. They're not at the very top. But they go up. They see God. And, of course, we have other passages that indicate that no one can see God and live to tell about it. And so we assume maybe this is some form of God. Maybe God shielded himself in some way. Uh, to protect them from his true appearance? I don't know. But as they see God, they also see this pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. You know, I think some of us are probably thinking of, of what? The, the sea of glass before the throne of God in Revelation chapter 4. And I think that reference is also repeated once more later in Revelation. So there are some similarities. There is some kind of a a sea of glass, a sea of sapphire before the Lord, and, and he is pictured as being on this sea of glass in uh, here in Exodus chapter 24. I also want us to note uh, under his feet, in this passage, God is described as having feet. We don't always think in those terms either. So again, maybe this is why they were able to see God and live. It was some form of God. I, I just don't know. I, I may never understand this. Uh, but it's almost as if these men get kind of a sneak peek into God's throne room. Kind of the door cracks open a little bit, kind of as it did in the book of Revelation. And John was able to see uh, something of God in, in that chapter. Maybe something similar is going on here. Well, in verse 11, Moses, in writing this down, notes that God does not stretch out his hand against these men. And so it's almost as if God perhaps makes an exception to the rule that no one could see him and live. So he, he restrains himself from striking them down for seeing him. Maybe that's part of it here. And then they eat and they drink, apparently in God's presence, or perhaps shortly thereafter. And that's notable, how eating is associated with seeing God. It's almost this idea of fellowship. 
with people sitting down and eating together. I think there were a couple other covenants that were made in Genesis where a covenant was made, then they sat down and ate together, kind of uh, sealing the deal with a meal. Maybe that's what's going on here. Maybe a little bit of foreshadowing concerning the Lord's Supper, which, as we noted earlier, also is described as a celebration of the blood of the covenant. So certainly some uh, apparent parallels here between the Lord's Supper and this meal that takes place. Well, let's continue with Exodus 24, verses 12 through 15. Exodus 24, 12 through 15. Now the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses arose with Joshua his servant, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. But to the elders he said, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a legal matter, let him approach them. Then Moses went up to the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. Well, after the meal with the elders on the side or at the base of this mountain, the Lord wants Moses to come up further so that God can give him these stone tablets with the law and the commandments on them. And I think this is the first reference to the tablets in Scripture. We had the Ten Commandments given back in Exodus 20 a few chapters ago, uh, but nothing had actually been written down yet, at least according to that passage as I remember it. Uh, Moses had done some writing earlier in a previous chapter, but now God would be the one writing the law on these tablets of stone. Well, Moses then takes Joshua further up the mountain with him, uh, Moses had previously called on Joshua as a military leader. You may remember that from the battle against the Amalekites. And now Joshua almost seems to be a trusted assistant, a servant. I think the New International Version refers to him as an aide. And uh, Moses tells the elders to wait here while he and Joshua go up and will come back. And then notice here, Moses in his absence appoints Aaron and Hur to fill in in case there are any tough cases when he's gone. So he anticipates maybe being gone for a while. He doesn't know when he's coming back. And so if anything happens, <laughs> I need you two guys to handle it when I'm gone. And so Aaron and her are therefore in charge for the time being. And Moses heads on up, and then at that point a cloud covers the mountain. Well, let's close tonight with Exodus 24, verses 16 through 18. That's our last, uh, last little paragraph tonight. Exodus 24, 16 through 18. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. And to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Moses entered the midst of the cloud as he went up to the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. Once again, we have a reference to six days followed by the seventh. And when you hear six days followed by a Sabbath, what comes to your mind? I think most of us who know something about the Bible, you know, we come across numbers that seem to be significant in the Bible, some that are repeated, and, and this is certainly one of those situations. We've already noted that God created everything in six days and rested on the Sabbath. This is the explanation for the Sabbath day and the Sabbath rest, that we follow God's example. He did this for our benefit. And now we have Moses waiting on God for six days up on, their, uh, up on the mountain, followed by God calling to Moses on the seventh day. So there's some kind of a cycle here, and uh, maybe something to that. Uh, from the ground, though, as the people are looking up, all they could see was fire. So from their perspective, it didn't look good, did it? Um, they know Moses was headed to the top of the mountain. Now they look up. The mountaintop is engulfed in flames. And he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights, which is another significant number of days in the Bible. We think of uh, the great flood where it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. We also think of Jesus fasting for, for 40 days and 40 nights. And I'm sure there are other references to 40 days in the Bible as well. But Moses is up there on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 24. Like I said, a fairly short chapter. Looks like we're done in about 25 minutes or so, maybe a little bit less. But uh, tonight we've continued looking at the details of the Law of Moses and some uh, details concerning how that was delivered. And hopefully we'll get back to this next week as we transition into some instructions concerning the tabernacle and the furniture that these people were to build for the tabernacle. That'll be coming over the next several weeks. So... Uh, worship is important, and now they have to be given instruction in exactly how to worship God. And so that's coming 
over the next several weeks, at least as far as the uh, infrastructure is concerned. So again, thank you for joining us tonight. We're glad you took the time to be with us. Again, if you have any questions, concerns about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, something we need to be praying about, let me know. Uh, send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are holy and awesome. You are the great and mighty God who spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. And we're thankful tonight for your law under Moses and for how it prepared people for the arrival of your son, the Messiah. Father, we are looking forward to seeing you face to face and gathering together around the crystal sea where we can worship alongside the angels in your presence. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.